The, the entrepreneurial energy in China is so raw. China is aggressively trying to attract foreign talent. Welcome to this edition of Crossover. I'm Ji Xiaojun, and I'm Yi Yixu.、Mm -hmm. Today's show is about China's job market for foreign nationals. For foreign nationals. Yes. Well, you know, Xiaojun, I've、mm -hmm. been in China for so long. It's, for. It's been almost 15 years. It's almost forever.、Uh, yes. It seems like a really long time. So I don't really think of myself as a foreigner, but、uh, I guess technically the show is. For, about somebody like me, say, yeah, a foreign national. When we say foreign national, it means a foreign passport holder, right? Exactly. Somebody、yeah. with a well, I, I kind of think it's somebody with a for this show, somebody who's has. Are, 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 you, are you a foreigner? Are you? <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. Technically, I think、yeah. I am. But a the、foreigner. thing is, we always have that question mark actually in our head, in our mind. Why are you foreigners here in China stealing our job? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not really. But we welcome. Actually,、uh, at the same time, we're now seeing the cha、uh, the changes in national policies. Where it、And、seems China is trying to attract more high-profile foreigners、Absolutely. to work in China. Absolutely. And I think in those 15 years, foreign nationals like myself, we've seen、yeah. a dramatic shift in what China is looking for and the types of people who are coming to China to work. Today, we have three experts who are going to be talking about just that. We have Frank Gallo. Guo Xing and Richard Robinson,、yeah. welcome to Crossover. Welcome, three foreign nationals. <laughs> no, not really. No, no. <laughs> not really.、Yeah. <laughs> Franco, where are you from? I'm from、uh, originally from New York, then Boston, and now L.A. But now you're actually based in Beijing. I'm based in Beijing. Yes. For the past. Fifteen years.、So、you came、and、to China at the same time. Yeah,、right? yeah, we were on the same, the same plane. Exactly. <laughs> we met each other way back then. No, just kidding.、Um, but Frank Gallo is a leadership trainer here. Leadership coach. Leadership coach. And、okay. leadership consultant. Okay, great. So it's、right. more about you're passing on the message that you've learned from the past fifteen、mm -hmm. years to、yes. maybe the new foreign nationals coming to work and live in China. That's at least half of it, and、All、then、right. also working with、uh, Chinese leaders who are working in Western firms. See, it's all about cross-cultural, yes, cross-border、yes, right, exchange.、Exactly. A lot of knowledge to impart there.、Mm. Um, our second guest, Guo Xing. We're from.、Um, <laughs> HR. He's a he's an HR consultant. Okay.、Uh -huh. Chinese、That's, national or? Yeah,、uh, I have a long trail of migration. Started out of Heilongjiang province. Uh huh. And then come to Beijing study, and then went to U.S. study and work, and then come back to China. And Richard Robinson, who's、uh, sec his second time on crossover. So last time was about、he's, the stand-up comedy. Yes, he's、huh? also a comedian, but he's also a tech entrepreneur. So the the, the、uh, automatic response was, "Tell us a joke." <laughs> <laughs> but, but Richard has also been here for how long? Uh, it'll be 16 years in December, and you can count 20 years if you count the four years in China Light down in Hong Kong that I spent. Okay, so, so you beat Frank and I here. 15 years ago, when you came as CEO of a multinational, it seems like that was a very common way by、Traditional、which foreigners way, came. Yeah. yeah, they came as、um, high-level、yeah. managers or directors or CEOs,、um, and they had expat packages. It was a very different world from what we're facing today. Can you tell us how things are changing, Guo Xing? Things have changed、uh, a lot, and、uh, 15 years ago, a lot of expats are, you know, paid and compensated uh, uh, with this old-fashioned structure. So this is one of the difficult areas. Yeah, yeah. At the time, it was, the time、uh, it was、uh, you would get a hardship allowance. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And、mm -hmm. not only that, uh, and uh, back then, the, it's more standardized expatriate package. Including all the pay, the benefits, the home visits,、uh, uh, the car account. With the, the foreign experts bureau. No, it's it's multinational, multinational. common practice. Oh, with multinational. Yeah. Yeah. Mar yeah. Yeah. Just a common practice. Foreign、practice. experts don't get that type of treatment.、I'm、yeah,、sure. but you're still called as the foreign experts, <laughs> right? Foreign <laughs> specialists.、Mm. And、uh, things evolved. Things changed、uh, over the years as more and more people like me, Hai Gui, coming back. To return the sea turtles, the sea turtles, Chinese scholars, the, the who have returned, returned,、uh, creating some、experience. competition in the job market. Right,、oh, you're saying right. it was very expensive at that point of time、yeah. for for multinational、uh, companies to that, send、uh, somebody over. Typically, an executive, you know, CEO level, CFO、uh -huh. level person coming、uh, to China, it costs more than a million dollar for the company. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. 
So yeah. basically, so Franco, you were owning a million dollars at the time when you were sent. Well, to China. that was 15 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 he's right. I mean, I, we used to use as a rule of thumb that whatever your salary was, the the, the cost to the company was about three times that. Right. Yeah. Right. You yeah. would get housing. You would get benefits. You would get a car and driver. You would get a hard, hardship allowance. Richard Robinson, when you came. 16 years ago. I got nothing. What did you get? Nothing. <laughs> so I, I first came here, I, I was attracted to China because I met this crazy Australian guy and he said there's four trips in the world and you have to do them by land. North, South America, Australia, Africa, and Europe to Asia. So I took the train through Siberia, Mongolia to China Seriously. in 1993. Well, what is it called? Number one train? Or what? Uh, it's called the Trans-Siberian. Trans uh -huh. And I had I had high expectations for the cultural part of China, but I didn't really, ha I had low expectations for, you know, the economic part, but I got here and the dragon just, caw -caw! That was 2000. That was 93. 93. 93. So then you never, But I, I, I could left. smell and feel the, 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 mm -hmm. the energy here. Like this the is the energy. biggest story of our life, right? Mm -hmm. So the you came as a tourist matter. first. I came as a tourist and I had no choice. China grabbed me, the dragon grabbed me, and hasn't let go since. But how did you come back? You didn't come back until like 2000? I got, my, I got my MBA, and then I fell in love with the internet, and then I did another overland trip. I rode a bicycle through Africa, but then I showed up here in 96 in to Africa. be an internet guy in China, and someone had to tell the internet to show up before I got here. There was, no, there was no internet, so I spent four years in Hong Kong, but then I moved here in 99, 2000, and I've been an executive entrepreneur in the tech space, which has been another amazing just volcano of uh, activity. So you created your own job opportunity. That's right. I showed up basically with a backpack and a bad attitude and like, let's, let's go, right? Let's because do it. I, I feel like the, the entrepreneurial energy in China is so raw. How have you seen in the years your the fellow expatriates change, you know, over mm. the people have come, people have gone? Mm. How, how do you reflect yeah, I, on I would that? say there's probably a little bit more opportunity for the younger, hungrier, um, more uh, nimble and uh, better, you know, language trained, you know, uh, uh, younger expat. And the older expats, like, I, I'm older now, right? And my kids go to the International School of Beijing and I can feel the fabric of the school change because a lot of these expat packages are going away. Right. And, and they're, they're just bringing in locals who are, you know, uh, so much more effective now. I've I, heard I, that and I've yeah. seen that too. And, and, and we see real. many more haikwe coming yes. into the international school. We have to well. explain to our viewers right. what haikwe means. Oh, you in explain, English, right? you explain. And then basically, we are referring to a group of people who have uh, some overseas education experience and then come back yet again. Right, Chinese to, nationals who Chinese went nationals abroad and for and live and work. Think, think about that turtle China. and finding Nemo that swims back. Yes. Right? <laughs> the sea turtle. <laughs> That's all sea turtle. The literal translation but, is sea turtle. <laughs> Do you, do you guys see some new developments, say, people mm. would come, maybe like yourself as a tourist, mm. then I'll try to stay on, to find a job. Is it mm. one of the new uh, developments these days? Right? That's certainly a new phenomenon, especially for a lot of young people that are uh, full of energy. They find uh, the abundance of opportunities. They wanted to come Is here. it easy for them to find a job? Say, I just want to stay in China and then I, I want to find a job. China is compared to U.S. and other places, mature economy is relatively easy. Right. Uh, so, so what are companies in China looking for now? Mm. I mean, how has that changed? Both on the side of, of yeah. multinational companies as well as uh, Chinese Domestic companies, market, yeah. right? What are they looking for when they think, okay, I'm going to hire somebody from the international um, market? China is aggressively trying to attract foreign talents, still do. Mm. And uh, what I mean talent is that uh, uh, someone with expertise in certain areas, either management or mostly in R&D, in design, in technology, in mm. all the areas that uh, have certain expertise uh, if they want to come to work in China. Uh, who's hiring? Well, in the past, expatriates, you know, the word uh, mostly sent by multinationals. And now n more and more local companies, mm. private companies, mm. listed companies, even state-owned enterprises begin to hire uh, foreign nationals. And they're not just hiring foreign nationals, they're hiring the right foreign nationals, mm -hmm. meaning that there mm -hmm. must be a certain type a of point. profile or personality or character that they're looking for. Frank, is yeah. there a specific... Well, well I, think, I think that this whole discussion is, is, is very interesting and very relevant. Uh, I have a slightly different perspective, and that is that I think um, 
Gorshin is right. The government is, is working hard to recruit experts in certain areas. But um, there are a lot of really talented people in China, Chinese people. Mm. So I find that it's the, the, the focus on, re, on attraction of foreigners is much more specific than it used to be, say, 10, 15 years ago, where basically if you were a foreigner and you had an MBA, you could come here and get a great job. Right. I think it's, it's much more... Mm. Uh, it's much more competitive. Competitive. Right. These days. And, and the second thing is that I think Richard's experience is really not, uh, off, not common. It's not my experience that people can be as successful as you. You're very uh, unique. I think special. he is. Oh, I think you, he, you know, we all know that. I, 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 I don't think I'm anything special. I just think I'm too stupid or stubborn <laughs> to, to give up. I but but, but, I, but I, I have plenty of people in my peer group and cohort. That, so I guess it depends on which cohort you're in. Because mm. I, I, all, all the people that I know mostly came over, you know, sort of just with a, a stick and a bag and, you know. Right, just because like a hobo they're, they're and, like, the cohort China, right? who are here. Yeah. But what I see are the people who come and then leave. Uh, you know, there's right. so yeah. many That's people who yeah. come here to be a teacher and, a and they, pool, yeah, and they yeah, yeah, and they just can't make it and and they leave. What right. what how come mm. they make it? Well, in some cases, it's the it's the language. Uh, they just don't want to put in the time and energy to do it. They came here. Do for they the, have to speak Chinese? Because I mean, it seems uh, English you know, is totally you know, okay in Beijing. I, I think you need to. If the, I think if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you really. Well, I, I would say this: you don't necessarily have to understand Chinese, but you have to understand the culture. Chinese, if and you know what I mean, people. right? The people, right? right? Mm -hmm. So, so there are plenty of instances of people who don't necessarily speak well, or they surround themselves with very strong lieutenants who are mm -hmm. bilingual. Right. But right. you have to understand Chinese. You have to figure out your way to navigate through that. Yes, yes. it depends and on what you're going to do. Right. If you're if you're going to be working mostly with foreigners, mm -hmm. you probably don't have to speak mm -hmm. Chinese that much. Mm -hmm. But but if you do want to really integrate yourself into the market. I right. I mean, really you're different. right. I mean, I think the old paradigm, again, were these Western, you know, CEOs or high-level directors who would come and, and basically they're the boss, mm. so they don't really need to integrate that well. Right. But right. these days, it's mm. really changing. What are they, you know, back to the, the, the aspect of profile and personality, what are employers now in China looking for in a foreign national, Guo Xing? Uh, let's compare ten, to 10 years ago, uh, the, there are high expectations for foreign nationals. Yeah. They want a major big shots coming in to solve big problems or making, making major impacts. Now they're more realistic. And uh, uh, so a lot of local companies hiring expatriates or foreign nationals are for certain, for their expertise, mm. their experience being a product manager, being a, a developer, being an architect, for, for internet in the area that uh, those are popular uh, job destinations. One more question about, you know, sometimes actually we, we, when we talk about foreign nationals in China among Chinese peers, sometimes we would complain about the privilege actually, privileges enjoyed by foreign nationals. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're treated like the uh, super citizens. Or they get higher salaries. Exactly. Right. And do you still get that now? I mean, in terms from different aspects? <laughs> when I came here in 2001, that was 100% true. I felt like Huang Di. I felt like the king. <laughs> An emperor, right. My salary, my, the way I was treated, the benefits I received were really very unique. I never got anything like that in the U.S. Mm. But when I look around now, um, I think those benefits are, are, are reserved for very few people. Mm. And uh, it's also very common in, in Chinese companies as well. So I don't, f I don't feel that. Mm. I, I did. I did feel that. But I don't feel foreigners are treated that much better now. Mm. In fact, as Guo Xin said, the trend is more towards localization. So I think, I think that the package you get, and, and I'm not talking as an entrepreneur, because you're paying for the school yourself. <laughs> and, and, but, but I mean, if you come as a, as a as a corporate executive, you will get the school paid for for your children, but because right. it's eighty thousand dollars cash, uh, cash, USD. your, your mm. company is not going to hire that person right. if if they can find somebody I think, somebody locally. I think what you're saying is the package is now reflective of the role, not necessarily whether or not they're a foreign national or a Chinese That's national. That's right. That's right. Right. So just to summarize this segment, just one quick answer: Is the market for foreign nationals growing, or is it shrinking? I'm guessing it's not an easy answer, but quick. M morphing. 
<laughs> evolving. <laughs> evolving. It is evolving. evolving. All right. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, when we come back, we're going to talk about cross cultural differences in the workplace. Please stay with us. The, the foreign boss will come back and say, What's wrong with these people? If I really take my driving skills from Boston and bring them to Beijing, then everybody is wrong. Welcome back to Crossover. Let's continue our discussion about mm. foreigners working in China. I mean, in between during the break, you guys were talking about how the hardship allowances were gone. Now it's not anymore. And people, I guess, I mean, foreign nationals working in China, right. they sometimes need to adapt to the development, well, to the hardship, new reality. Right. Hardship China. allowances were given because 15 years ago, mm. nobody really wanted to come to China. It was a bit of an incentive it's for these before they discovered for these this golden mine. Exactly. You know? But China is no longer a hardship. You could get anything that you want here. It might just be a little bit more expensive right. now. It's um, more getting more expensive even than it, in the U United States. Oh, absolutely. Sure. It Absolutely. Is. Well, Richard, in the first segment, was talking about education. Mm. Education here, if you want international education, it's yeah. very expensive. It's still a privilege you're trying to get. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, I, what I'm saying is, when we talk about this, you know, differences mm. in terms of expectations you might have about working and living in China, things might be different now compared to like 15, mm -hmm. 20 years ago. And Franco, we know that you have a book. You have actually several books published You've written three. in China about yes. the cross-border, cross-cultural differences yes. that people might be expecting come across actually in China. You, you're bringing what? What is that about? This is called the Enlightened Leader, uh, or or Chi Di. Lessons from China. Lessons from China. The, you know, very briefly, the first book I wrote was for foreigners. It was about leadership in China, and I was trying to share some of my tips, some of the things I learned as a foreigner who had to lead in China. The second book was like the other side of that coin. It was designed for Chinese professionals who wanted to learn more about the West. But this book was a labor of love because I have been working as an executive coach uh, for about 10 years in China. And I love the work. And most of the coaches who I know here, many are Chinese, many are foreign, also love the work. There's thousands of books written about coaching, m most of them in the West. There are books in China written about coaching. But as far as I know, even to this day, there's no book in English about coaching specifically in China. So give us a key lesson from your learnings. Can I see the book? Of course. So what are the key messages? Yes, what is teaching? just one key. I just want to hear something more concrete. Uh, for example, uh, many foreigners come here thinking, oh, I'm a leader, I'm going to empower my team, they're going to run off and, and own the work and do it. But in China, people are more interested in hierarchy, and so they want to uh, be told a little bit more specifically what to do. Chinese people, generally, generally speaking, all, all of this when we say, talk about culture or sociology, it's generally, mm -hmm. right? right? But generally, Chinese people don't like to make mistakes. Chinese people don't want to lose face in front of their boss, so very often they won't act. Mm. And the boss, the, the foreign boss, will come back and say, what's wrong with these people? You know, why, why are they not doing what, it, you know, if I asked them to do this in Cincinnati, uh -huh. they would have done it right away. Mm. But here people don't, don't act. So I think foreigners need to learn some of these cultural differences. Things well, are done and differently. To, right, and to have the right expectations Correct. I, w I was I mean, looking at Guoxing. Yeah. Do you yeah. agree? Uh, yes, there are a lot of areas that uh, culturally there are difference uh, between, you know, work environment in China and work environment in the West, mostly in the U.S. And the way approach to work, the way of thinking, relationship between the boss and subordinates are very different. How different? Uh, in the West, it's probably more equal, in a way. It's just your Again, job. Again, the hierarchy issue. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. your jo job designation. That's your CEO, your uh, superintendent, and that's your job designation. But where people in that part were equal. 
We're talking a lot about foreign executives that come to China, but we know that those numbers are decreasing, and there are more and more people who had experienced China the way that you have experienced China, Richard. Mm -hmm. We're just coming on your own and trying to make it on your own. What yeah. sort of cultural problems did you have, or issues, or barriers did you have yeah. uh, when you came, and, are, and mm -hmm. perhaps are still struggling with mm -hmm. sometimes? Mm -hmm. Richard, you seem to be a little bit lost when the two gentlemen <laughs> here are talking about the hierarchies in a multinational mm -hmm. company. Well, you know, I, so I, I think in general, right. <laughs> multinationals and uh, you know uh, newer startup companies are just fundamentally different around the world, right? So, See, so I mean, it yeah, really is two true. different that's cultural, con you know, right. and and oftentimes people that work in MNCs, it's difficult for them to transition and, and vice versa, right? Mm -hmm. So I, 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 that's not uh, that's a different kind of cross. You don't really have a hierarchy. Yes, exactly. It's all flat. Yeah, well, you, 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 exactly. you try to, right? Yeah. right? You try to, and the reason why is because you just really have this sense of urgency and you know, uh, sort of self-learning organization. But you know, I think I'll, I'll give you. I, I, I drove here today. Right? Mm -hmm. I drove in Beijing. And um, if I really take my driving skills from Boston and bring them to Beijing, then everybody is wrong, right? You're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, right? And, and I think a lot of people do that, right? They come here and, like, like you said, you see some foreigners, like, what is wrong with these people? There's nothing wrong with these people, we have right? Our rules, There's right, nothing right? wrong with these people. What's wrong with you? Look in the rearview <laughs> right. mirror, right? So I think, you're the I think only one, right? You're the only one, right? If I really want to change every Chinese driver and go, oh my God, no, what is wrong with you? Come on, come on, right? I mean, like, I'm not going to do that, right? So what, instead, what you have to do is, like Bruce Lee says, like, be like water and flow. And, and did you and, did you learn this lesson right away? Well, my or? entire professional professional experiences in China, right? Right. So I basically have to learn that this is a very high context culture, right? And there's, uh, you know, I, I, you know, you have to, do, you have to do things um, in, in, a, in a, oftentimes in a local way to be effective, right? More but adaptive to the. You, you have to yes. be adaptive. Yet, yet though, China is also like still been developing in the last 20 years, right? So there are some Western sensibilities and Western skills or, or global skills and global sensibilities of, that you can bring, be like, okay, I understand you have to do that in a local way, but let's do this this way because this is just kind of best in class. And we, this you know, is we have, interesting. You know, you're so saying so you're sort of like merging that together. Yes, you know? it's starting to come. These, like you said, mm. these. It's integrating now into Chinese mm. management, mm. right? Mm. As uh, while you have these hikeway who are coming mm. back too, because mm. they have adopted some of these strategies. Mm. But maybe we can kind of turn. The, 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 the angle of this discussion, because we've talked about what it takes to be successful, but who are the foreign nationals who, I guess, so to speak, don't really make it? You know, after a year mm -hmm. or two, they say, I'm going to go. What, <laughs> is there a certain profile? Again, we're generalizing, you know, mm -hmm. but is there a certain profile of, of the person who, who, who doesn't fit here in yeah, China? Yeah, ones, the ones who I've encountered uh, who don't fit are generally people who are selected for their expertise but really have no global mindset, mm -hmm. no interest in China. They think they know how to do it. They think my job is to come here and teach these Chinese how to do it the German way or the American way or the British way. Mm. And those people very quickly fail uh, because they, they never appreciate the value of China. Mm. They never appreciate diversity. They didn't appreciate diversity in the first place. So I think those are the ones who, who who immediately get put into coaching <laughs> and the ones who, who often uh, f finish their contract and go home or sometimes right. go home. Is it getting right. more difficult these days? We were talking about this topic. Is mm. it getting more difficult these days for foreigners to stay, to have a stable mm. career, mm. say, in China? Um, another good question, and I'll, I'll try and be brief because I can talk about this for the whole segment. You need another book. Yeah? But I won't. I won't. <laughs> Uh, when I came to Beijing in 2001, it really was wonderful. It was really easy to be a foreigner here. People, the, the government wanted you, other corporations wanted you. Foreigners were, were felt very welcome. As, um, as Guo Xin said before, just by going into a company and you were a foreigner, you got respect right away. That's quickly changed in Beijing. Uh, I think that um, it, it's not that you're disrespected, but you're not treated up here. Not as with to privileges, be. but treated normally. Treated, treated normally and sometimes less. You know, we sometimes do see, I've, I've, I've heard people and I've seen people on TV say, well, you know, the, 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 far, the, the West used to be our leaders, but now look at how terrible their economy is and what can we learn from them. But 
I had this really great experience these last few months. I've been doing a lot of work in Guangzhou, and I find that there, it's, it reminds me of my early days in Beijing. Uh, so I'm thinking that in other parts of China, besides Beijing, where in Shanghai, we, we, maybe it's saturated. Maybe, maybe. Right. It's saturated. Right. Whereas I think, you know, down in Guangzhou, I'm very welcome. Oh, yeah, we need your expertise. Are you saying you don't feel welcome here anymore I'm, in I'm, Beijing? I'm being honest. I feel less welcome in Beijing <laughs> than I do when <laughs> yeah. I go to Guangzhou. So, Jean, we've been focusing this discussion. I mean, right. We've been heavily weighting it on foreign nationals who come and work for companies. But there's a whole other aspect to this, which Richard actually represents. They're the entrepreneurs, the foreign nationals who come here to build businesses right, here. Right. When we come back from the short break, we're going to talk about that. I want to thank you, Frank and Guoxing, for joining us. Um, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. And Richard, you are the lucky, or maybe the, you're the unlucky one who gets to join us for segment mm, three. For me, um, thank you again. Mm. Please stay with us. Welcome back to Crossover, and now we're going to start our new perspective. We talk about a, uh, entrepreneurs, you know, in foreign national entrepreneurs in China. We have two new guests here. We have Tim, we have Jeff. Welcome. But the first question is, we're talking about foreign <laughs> nationals, right? We were talking Foreign nationals <laughs> entrepreneurs. Are you a foreign national? Uh, well, <laughs> you're you double see, checking, I, right? I have to hesitate because it's it's hard to explain. Hard to explain. <laughs> yeah, I actually grew up in China. And so you were born uh, here and grew up in China. Yes, mm -hmm. I I'm from a few cities from northern China. You know, Baoding, <laughs> to me, you're from Ohio, a few cities. Xuzhou, yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, and uh, went to university in Beijing. I see. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then after that, I worked briefly in Beijing, uh, for and and then quickly went out to a study in the UK. But technically, uh, you are a foreign national. Foreign uh, I am, yeah. Yes. I haven't made that clear. Yes, I hold a foreign passport. Uh -huh. but, but you're probably the least foreign of all four of us foreign <laughs> nationals here. <laughs> uh, no, technically, you need a visa to come back to your yes. hometown. Uh, but I live in Hong Kong now, and I, I see you. I've got okay. the, yeah, it's, it's Things all are very, getting complicated. Okay. Very complicated. And Tim, uh, you know, I mean, it goes without saying, he is right. a foreign national here, and yeah. you've Where established from? your own business. Uh, yes, so I'm from the UK. Okay. All right. All right. You have your own company. Uh, so I have a company with a Chinese partner. Okay. Right. Tell us how you got here. So I came back in 2010 to learn Mandarin. Let's see. And I went to BLCU. And huh. yeah. So where you yeah. went? Yeah. 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 So I did a language program there, and it was six months long. It was one semester. Mm. And then after that, I really felt like I hadn't learned anything. <laughs> I came what, here with, what are you saying? Yeah, well, I came here with what the did idea. you do for those six months? No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Well, I, 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 Plotting, uh, I, I naively thought that a year would be enough to be yeah. more than fluent. And I know that earlier you were discussing, you know, what's one of the biggest obstacles to foreigners. And I think that one of the things that many people underestimate here is that I now view China as being like a united version of Europe. And so when you come here, you think that you're learning Chinese and you're learning about China, but actually like Hebei and then Guangzhou have yeah. their own culture mm -hmm. and their own language and Regional their own culture. history. Yes. And it's like going to Sweden and then you learn Swedish and you're like, oh, I don't understand Italy. Mm. It's, mm. it's two very, very different places with very, very different ideas. What is Chinese. your business mm. about? So I, I run a gym. When you're talking about the obstacles, you know, how difficult it might be to understand the regional differences, the regional cultural differences in mm -hmm. China, is that a part of your, the difficulties that you come across as an entrepreneur, say, in China? I don't think there's so many uh, regional difficulties here. I think the difficulty is more that there's just a lot of stuff that you as a foreigner, a foreign national, will always have trouble doing here. What are those? Well, anything re involving a government department. Mm. So mm. establishing your own business, you needed a Chinese partner. I didn't. Act so I actually established a business right. on my own. And then uh, I met my Chinese partner who I merged with him. Okay. Uh, and so has that made things easier for you now yeah, that you have a Chinese uh, partner? Yeah. <laughs> is that, Richard, is this something that is... Very Certainly. Common. Well, you know, I think, you know, we talked about before about the sort of macro view. I mean, entrepreneurship is just hard anywhere, right? Most businesses yeah. want to fail and there's, you know, limited resources and you don't have much of a reputation. So entrepreneurship is tough. And specifically, 
I think that there is this extra layer of uh, maybe, you know, the hand of the government, right? Bureaucracy mm. and maybe, you know, some sort of censorship or limitations, right? But the censorship or limitations, that's applicable to everybody, right? And yeah. the bureaucracy is also applicable to everybody, even Chinese, yeah. right? So what you do here, in my experience, is you throw people at it. You get somebody to wait in line, yeah. and then they, you know yeah. what I mean? So it's like, for me, it's something that I've done enough businesses here that that just becomes part of the process. But and you need to learn that, and you need to yeah. navigate that. But, and have but the it's right become a lot more navigable and a right. lot more uh, addressable. Like, you know, Tim started on his own, and then he merged later because it just makes it maybe a little bit stronger. So you can go it alone, and, and you can navigate it, right? But it's like, that's, that's not really the issue here. The issue is like, can you make stuff that people want? You might complain. Uh, it's getting easier and more difficult these days for foreign nationals to have a business, to, uh, to be an entrepreneur in China. But we're not actually seeing, well, according to my knowledge, more foreign nationals developing their own companies, mm. their own businesses, uh, to be an uh, entrepreneur mm. in China. Why mm. is it happening Damn like right. that? Uh, complaining, forget about complaining. Yeah. This is the biggest story of our <laughs> life, right? Are you kidding me? You're going to jump the off that The rural couch. to urban migration, the GDP per capita. You want to come here and be in like ancient Rome and a gladiator in that arena, right? You want to come here. What is it that you're seeing in China that you so, don't so, see so, in so, other countries? So, so two things. One is there's this captive consumer market. Like I got here in 93, a million uh, middle class. I moved here in 99, 5 million. Now there's 230 million, right? Yeah, power it's is real. Exponential. Right. You want to do something for China, that's there. The other flip side of it is in the tech space, you either do something focused on China or you harness like this kung fu ball of power and whoosh, push it out to around the rest of the world. And that's happening in a big way. Beijing that's has what I'm gonna amazing do. muscle, <laughs> amazing tech muscle, and you push that to the rest so of the world. So could you do what you're doing now, Tim? Could you do what you're doing now back home? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah? Would but, you be as successful? Uh, I, right, so that's a very different question, right? I think that... Uh, on top of what Richard just said, you've got the, the consumer base, you've got uh, the, 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 the platforms that do it. There's also the fact that there's just massive gaps. Because in, you've introduced yeah. something that's very new to the So, so, so you, you, you told me earlier there's 11 uh, venues doing CrossFit here, yeah, but LA has the same population? Yeah, so, well, I mean, officially the population of LA and Beijing are the same, but I think we can agree that Beijing's probably about 30 million, something, something, something like that in the mm. surrounding area. But yeah, LA will have somewhere around 200 of the CrossFit gyms that, you know, a CrossFit gym, uh, whereas here there are 11 CrossFit gyms. Right. So it's, it's, a, it's a very new concept. And, you know, that and in itself, that's, it's a, a new market, right, basically. Mm. Mm. So you're trying to capture this early entry, you know, set type advantage, of advantage. Yeah. yeah, well, that's the funny thing again, right? So it, it's, it's, it's a little bit like I've seen the future because I mm. came from the UK where there were CrossFit gyms, mm. right? And I've already seen what happens in the UK with this exact industry. And I've seen it in the US as well. And you see oh, this is going to happen. But because why, why specifically China? I mean, when you have an idea to be an entrepreneur. Oh, I didn't, I didn't think I was going to be an entrepreneur. Like, I came here very much like Richard did. I, I, I had nowhere to live. I literally, I booked a place at BLCU, and I, I got here. I found a flat in the three days after I got here, and I liked it. And then while I was here, I started to go to the gym more because in the winter, it's freezing and you don't want to be outside <laughs> and you want to stay fit and healthy and I just found that every gym that I went to was awful mm. and I figured I could do a better job. For all of the successful businesses I'm sure there are a lot of unsuccessful businesses that were started by foreign nationals. I mean, Including me. <laughs> yeah, <so. laughs> I mean, tell me, you said that you started, you, you've had a lot of startups in your last 16 mm. years here in China. Can you tell us about yes, that? Yes, so I've experience? been part of eight startups, you know, three as an executive and private companies that went public and I've started five companies myself and um, you know, I mean, that's a, that's a different story. I, I, like the existing company I have now, I started with the co-founder of the, you know, former Facebook of China, the co-founder of Renren, Renren right? right? So I have mm. an amazing Chinese co-founder and we have access to capital, ability to attract and retain talent, great execution, great company culture, check, 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 check. Mm. 
I can't say it's going so great now, right? I wish I could say it's going better, but that's, that's what startups are like, right? right? I mean, you don't necessarily have any guarantee from past success to future success. You have to make stuff that people want, right? Mm. And that's fundamentally the issue, right? Yeah. Whether it's China or anywhere else. The reason why China, I would say the two major reasons are because of the consumer base and because of skills, mm. right? Not, not necessarily cost, really the big issue here. There, there is like in Shenzhen, that like uh, Tim Cook from Apple was asked, why do you do manufacturing in China? He's like, not because of cost, it's because all the tie-in uh, uh, tool and die manufacturers in America can fit in this studio. In China, it would need two football stadiums. That's yeah. wow. hardware hub is in Shenzhen. The tech hub is in Beijing. And there's yeah. so many other examples of that. And there, it's just this amazing clay to, to mm. build something really you know, valuable. Mm. And, and then I, I continue to, to be very bullish about, uh, about, about the future of mm. you know, creating business in China. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jeff, earlier you said that you are concentrating on the China market, yeah. and then you're going to plan on, uh, I guess, on spreading it, spreading it yeah. throughout yeah. In, in the inter international market. Yes. Um, why again? Why China? It, yeah, That's your I home mean, country. Yes. Uh, no. No. It's not not for that. I, I have a, a quite different case from Tim's and which is basically uh, I'm I'm coming up with a with a small innovation, uh, but it's an innovation uh, against a th three or four hundred year tradition. Uh -huh. So it, it's, um, um, l let me explain what I'm doing yeah. first. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm trying to persuade everybody in the world to play piano for fun. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. That's yeah. a big mission. Huh? Yeah, so <laughs> basically it's, the trick is in the notation. You know, we have a tradition that lasted that worked for three or four hundred years for the professionals mm -hmm. uh, notation right. yeah but that that tradition has stopped the rest of the people you know people outside the professional field from like uh, treating their piano just like a soccer ball in their home yeah uh, or a badminton it's, it's, racket. it's intimidating it's right. intimidating yeah and and the um, so I have tweaked the standard notation a little bit to the effect that um, uh, anyone can basically uh, play the piano for fun. It's you kind know? of like piano pinyin or something. Uh, like it's that, yes. <laughs> exactly. It's the jianti version. Yeah, the, it's the, actually the like the simplified that. Version. version. That's right. So um, trademark. It, if you if you know even if you've never learned it before. Right. Um, but China is is a place where there are the most prodigies playing piano and playing musical instruments. Mm -hmm. We have um, 40 million people. We, right. Yeah, but it's also the most people that can read Chinese and that's really tough too, right? <laughs> so I guess that's... Yeah. So why do they need a simplified notation? Um, because when you talk about the people interested to play piano, not just in China, it's all around the world. And we're mostly talking about you know, people still reading the traditional but, I mean, notation. Jeff, when we talk about your case, you're not just, you know, your case. You're basically representing the group of people, the return Chinese, mm. who have overseas experience and mm. trying to have a, uh, you know, entrepre entrepreneurial opportunity back in China. Because you know this market, you know Chinese culture. At the same time, you have that overseas experience. Do you think that kind of a joint cultural understanding is going to help you with your business here in China? Uh, definitely, that's one factor. But what really drove me back to China is, is what Richard was talking about. The market? It's the market. Your, your question actually kind of devalues the Chinese consumer a little bit because you're suggesting that like, he might come in with his idea and Chinese people are like, oh, well, let's, let's do that because we're Chinese. Where I don't think that's the case. I think that Chinese people are like everyone else. They want the best possible product. And what yeah. he will find is that if his product is the best possible product, mm. then he's going to succeed. If Here he can first. access, yeah. if he can access the consumers, if he can make people aware of it. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, with, with the gym, like, yes, my gym is cheaper to set up. Uh, but it's also more expensive to run because we run uh, on a, a coaching basis. Like most of what we do is coaching people in group classes. Mm -hmm. So it's not like a normal gym where you just go in and you just kind of sit around and do whatever you want. You come in every day and 
every single time you come in, there's somebody there explaining what to do, how to do it, how long to do it for. Right. And well, let me, let me actually add, if you, if you don't mind, is that I think a lot of times people from Silicon Valley say come to China and they think about Big Brother and they think about copycat, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And they think, oh, that's, that's going to be your problem. That's not my experience here. The really two threads are yeah. incredible gladiatorial competitive drive yeah. and actual <laughs> innovation, right? So setting stuff up with the government you know, and maintaining a company, that's one issue, right? Dealing with Chinese staff, there's some cross-cultural issues, but Chinese staff are incredible yeah. and crazy hardworking mm. and like very driven and, and, and very, uh, you know, and, and morphed into something that's, you know, changed so drastically. 16 years I've been here, I've seen 30 probably years of development, right? What really is difficult is the competition here, right? right. Because the competitors yeah. Yeah. and the entrepreneurs here in China, like that's something that the West doesn't see or understand. It is, you know. And they catch on really fast. Wow, yeah. right. like wow, yeah. like that's, that's the story exactly. here. That's what you're fighting against every day. So there are a lot of people who are probably watching this show, you know, they've spent time in their homes or they've so spent time in cafes or offices. Are they attracting yes. more entrepreneurs? They, or that's scaring, what I'm saying. Scaring, they're thinking about their next Don't do business. It. And they're Don't thinking do about it. Don't do it. So just to close up the show, you know, what would be your advice to them? What, what should they think about? Don't come. <laughs> you know what? Like, Don't what, compete you know, with the, me. The, the first, the first uh, you know, show we did together was about comedy. And I met a comedian. He's like, "Don't do it. Don't do the comedy. Yeah. Don't even try." And then 15 years later, a guy comes up to me. And he goes, "I did it." And he goes, "Good, because everybody else I told not to do it. I saved them a lot of trouble. The people that right. did it anyway, they're, they're supposed to do it. So right. don't do it." <laughs> <laughs> I love it, Tim. Uh, so actually, Richard quoted Bruce Lee earlier: "Be like water." Uh, I would agree with that. In that, sometimes you have to kind of go with the flow, but there's also times where you have to be just like the tide against the rock and mm. just slowly grind it down and grind it down yeah. and grind it down Keep until working. it turns Great into analogy. sand because uh, there are times where you know you, you you're wrong and there are times where you're right and it's it's about you know learning to recognize which right. side am I on this time? Right. Mm. So d do it, come, do it, but <laughs> never touch yeah. Jane business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think for business people, uh, one should never complain about the entry barriers uh -huh. because it's stopping everybody. It's, yeah, it's, there you go, sure. It's making it as difficult, it, the same difficulty apply to everybody. Right. Um, and uh, so I echo Richard's view that, you know, it's not about the bureaucracy or difficulties in setting things up because it's about actually Business. the opportunities, mm -hmm. the vast opportunities that exist in China. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. I want to thank the three of you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you for yeah. your stories. All right. And thanks thank everyone at home for tuning in. We'll see you next time on Crossover. Goodbye. Bye for now. A new online video platform called Foreigner Research Institute is gaining massive popularity in China with a fan base of millions of followers. We have invited the founder and the internet celebrities who are featured on the platform to discuss the so-called new foreigner era. Foreigners who can think like mm. Chinese, foreigners who have the Chinese humor, foreigners who follow the Chinese pop culture. Stay tuned to this upcoming episode on Crossover.